Hey, y'all. My name is Susan Sparks, and I'm the senior pastor here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in New York City. We are a diverse community brought together by faith. We hope that you enjoy our service today. Good morning, Madison Avenue Baptist Church. It's Brian the Baritone, and our introit this morning is hymn number 277, Christians We Have Met to Worship, verses 1 and 3. Christians we have met to worship and adore the living God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Christians pray and holy man showered all around. Let us love our God supremely, let us love each other too. Let us pray for all earth's people till our God makes all things new. Christ will call us home to heaven, at the table we'll sit down. Christ will welcome us and serve us, living manna all around. The title of my sermon today is Loaves, Fishes, and Squirrels. <laughs> I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I'm going to actually give my sermon backwards. So I'm going to start with the moral of the story. So you ready? If we have faith and we act on that faith, then we will never ever live with a sense of scarcity. Now, just because you've got the moral, don't go reaching for the channel changer and head over to Netflix to watch, I don't know, The Last Dance about Michael Jordan. The best of the sermon is yet to come. So save Michael for later. Stay with me. And Cheryl Sims, that was for you. <laughs> If we have faith and we act on that faith, we will never ever live with a sense of scarcity. Which actually raises two questions in my mind. Number one, how do we know that? And number two, why do we care? Let's start with the first. How do we know that to be true? The best place to start is our wonderful scripture today. Jesus feeding the crowd with the loaves and the fishes. And you know what a great story that is. It's like Jesus whipping up a dinner party for 5,000 on the spot. It's so great. But obviously, I think there's more going on than just the simple story of the loaves and the fishes. There's, in this particular story, I think there are so many nuanced meetings. The one I want to talk about today is this being a story about scarcity thinking versus abundance thinking. Now, y'all remember the story. Obviously, it was just read a few seconds ago. Jesus had been teaching all day. They were all tired. And the disciples look at this big crowd of people and were like, uh, we got to send them home so they can go find their own food. Jesus says to them, uh, they don't need to go away. You need to feed them. And the disciples were like, but we only have five loaves and two fish. And the scriptures don't say this, but you know at that moment there was like a stare-off with the disciples looking at Jesus, Jesus looking at the disciples, them going. And finally, Jesus just kind of, I guess, breaks the silence and goes, bring it to me. Bring him. Come on. And so the disciples bring him the five loaves of bread and the two fishes, and he did something wonderful. He tells the people to sit down, and then he looks to heaven he gives thanks for what he had, those five loaves and those two fishes. And then in faith, he proceeds to break those few loaves of bread to feed that crowd. And you know what happened? It did feed them. And it didn't just feed them. They had enough left over after 5,000 people. Scarcity thinking versus abundance thinking. If we act on our faith, then we will never live with a sense of scarcity. 
Which brings us to my second question is, so why should we care? Brothers and sisters, we should care because scarcity thinking has seeped into the very fabric of our current world. The theologian Parker Palmer explained it this way. He said, quote, the quality of our active lives depends heavily on whether we assume a world of scarcity or a world of abundance. Do we inhabit a universe where the basic things that people need from food and shelter to a sense of competence and being loved are ample in nature? Or is this a universe where such goods are in short supply, available only to those who have the power to beat everyone else to the store? The nature of our action will be heavily conditioned by the way we answer those bedrock questions. In a universe of scarcity, only people who know the art of competing, even making war, will be able to survive. But in a universe of abundance, acts of generosity and community become not only possible, but fruitful as well." End quote. Clearly and sadly, we now live in a universe of scarcity where only people who know the arts of competing, even making war, will be able to survive. And why is that? Why do we fail to see or refuse to see the abundance that is all around us? Before I go on, you know, let me acknowledge and clarify one thing. There is real scarcity in our world. Please be clear. There is real scarcity in our world. For example, right now, 690 million people in this world are hungry. People in our midst who are hungry, people in New York City who are hungry, people in our neighborhoods who are hungry, people who are in our community of faith and are hungry. There is real scarcity in our world, but it doesn't need to be that way. And that, brothers and sisters, is why we should care. Real scarcity of some exists because of the perceived scarcity of many, because of latent fear that there's not enough for all of us. So we pull our loaves and fishes closer. And like the disciples, we turn the hungry crowd away saying, find food in your own village. We have none. That kind of fear-based thinking comes from an even deeper sense of scarcity, and that is a scarcity of love. When we as humans forget we are loved, we become fearful. Our hearts become tightly shut, and we perceive the world through a lens of scarcity. And these days, it's easy to understand how that happens. Because there are things in this life that devour that sense of love and abundance before we can even taste it. Can I have an amen? Right. Mm. You know, let me, let me completely shift gears for a minute. I'd like to share something with you now, something very difficult and painful for me to talk about. It is a battle, a vicious battle that Toby and I have been fighting ever since we got to our cabin in Wisconsin. It's hard for me to talk about because this enemy that we face has generated a hatred in me that is ugly and deep-seated. It all started the week we got to the cabin. Toby, being the amazing baker that he is, whipped up a fresh loaf of sourdough bread and put it on the windowsill to cool. We left for an errand only to come back to find a giant hole ripped through in the screen, the loaf of bread torn into shreds, and this guy sitting on the table caught red-handed. 
We chased him around until Toby finally got him in a fishing net and tossed his furry behind out into the yard. We repaired the screen, and then a few days later, in the middle of the night, that little furry creature came through, chewed through the screen again, and ate another loaf of bread. It all came to a head when after we had the hardware store owner put chew-proof screen on the window, we came home one afternoon after Toby had cooked dinner and we found this guy with his head buried in an entire casserole of mac and cheese. Mac and cheese, people. Mac and cheese. He stole our mac and cheese. You know, Revelations 6, 8 talks about this evil enemy. And I looked and behold a pale squirrel and hell followed after. Okay, so maybe you don't have a furry creature breaking into your house, eating your mac and cheese or your bread. Doesn't matter. We all have our squirrels in life. Those things that wiggle their way into our psyche and eat our loaves, our things in this life. It's, it's like the things in this life that devour our sense of love and abundance. Our, devour it before we even have a chance to taste it. Maybe the squirrel in your life is the one that sits on everyone's shoulder chattering about not having enough money. You don't have enough money. What if you lose your job? What if you can't pay your rent? Maybe the squirrel in your life is the one that scratches away with the haunting fears of what kind of country awaits our beloved black and brown children in the next generation. Maybe the squirrel in your life, like many of us, is the one that burrows its way into every waking moment with worries about COVID-19. Worries that that tickle in the back of your throat is an early symptom. Worried that the person in front of you in the grocery store who has selfishly chosen not to wear a mask, hello, is going to spew germs all over you. Worries that you or your child or you as a teacher may have to return to the Petri dish of a classroom this fall. Jacqueline, that one's for you. The squirrels in our life could be anything. I mean, how about the vortex of misinformation when we're bombarded with, where we're told that others are taking our loaves, that our rightful jobs and livelihoods are being stolen. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we have the worst side of America showing up these days. A side that devours all sense of abundance through hate and fear and selfishness and greed. And it affects everything we do. Some of you may have read the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Affected People. Effective People. It came out in like the 80s by a guy named Stephen Covey. I've read it like a hundred times. It's a great book, but it talks about this very thing. I want to share some words. Stephen Covey says, the scarcity mentality is the zero-sum paradigm of life. People with scarcity mentality have a very hard time being genuinely happy for the successes of other people, even, and sometimes especially, members of their own family or close friends and associates. It's almost as if something is being taken from them when someone else receives special recognition or success. You know people like that? I bet you do. On the other hand, the abundance mentality flows out of a deep inner sense of personal worth. It is the paradigm where there's plenty, plenty out there, enough to go around for everyone, and it results in the sharing of recognition, the sharing of goods and services, the sharing of possibilities and options and creativity. We live in a fearful universe of perceived scarcity, and it is a vicious cycle. And even though we're surrounded by abundant love every day of our lives, we don't see it. It is devoured before we can even taste it. So in fear, we shut off our hearts. 
which then makes us pull in our loaves and fishes closer, and we turn away the hungry crowd saying, find food in your own village. We don't have enough. It's so tragic. It's so tragic because Jesus showed us that it doesn't have to be that way. And he did it in two steps. His blueprint was two simple steps. First, he screened out the squirrels. Oh yeah, Jesus had his squirrels. His squirrels were the disciples. They were the naysayers, the non-believers, the things that devoured the possibility of abundance before the crowd could even taste it. We need to send these people home so they can find their own food. Like the screen over our kitchen window, Jesus screened out their scarcity thinking right up front. No, they don't need to go away. You need to feed them. You know, we can do the same thing. And it's so simple. We can screen out the naysayers. We can screen out the negativity, the things that eat at our sense of abundance. Maybe that means screening out the news every once in a while so we don't have headlines bombarding us 24-7. Maybe it means screening out constant scrolling of social media. Hello. (laughs) And it definitely means screening out negative, judgmental people in our lives. Amen. It's amazing what a strong screen can do to hold at bay the things that gnaw at our sense of abundance and love. But even with the strongest screens, as Toby and I found out, squirrels can still get in. And that's when you need step two, a strong hand to toss them out of your house. Now we used a fishing net. Jesus used God. Jesus took the ultimate symbol of scarcity, five loaves of bread and two fish. And keep in mind, he didn't even say how big those fish were. They may have been the size of the one I caught last week, which was not very big. He took five loaves and two little fish in the face of 5,000 people. Realistically, an utter impossibility. But rather than listen to the squirrels in his midst, Jesus took that tiny bundle of food. He looked to heaven. He gave thanks for it. And then in faith... He began to break it and share it. And right there, everyone was fed with food left over. Truly a miracle. But you know what? I don't don't think this was the, the miracle that we were all taught in like Sunday school when we were like six. The miracle that we thought of as like a magic trick where five loaves of bread and two fishes went poof into a banquet for 5,000 people. I think it was deeper. And I think it was a chain reaction based on faith. Like that fishing net that we use to scoop up the squirrel and toss him out the door. Jesus' act of faith of holding that bread to heaven and then literally breaking those few tiny loaves in the face of that huge crowd. That tossed the sense of scarcity out of the hearts of everyone watching. He inspired the crowd through his faith. And then I think slowly members of the crowd inspired by Jesus maybe began to reach into their tunic or their bag and find a tiny piece of bread or a piece of fish and break it and look around and see others who may not have that and take a piece in hand to them and so on and so forth through that entire crowd until everyone was fed. Everyone with extra leftover. I mean, what could our world look like if only we did the same thing? If we screened ourselves away from the things that gnawed at our sense of abundance, if we demonstrated the faith that Jesus showed and inspired others to open their hearts and to give of what they have, what would that be like? You know, it reminds me of a folk tale that I used to hear growing up, and I want to leave you with this today to think about. I'll date myself. It was from Captain Kangaroo. 
<laughs> he used to read this book all the time and I loved it so much. And some of you may remember the title. It was called Stone Soup. And I won't, you know, I, I wasn't going to read the book. I'll just tell you the story quickly. Two travelers are going along the road and they come to a village and they're tired and they're hungry and they need food. And so they go to the door of a local villager and knock and a woman answers the door. And one of the travelers says, we're very, very hungry. Would you have any food to spare? She says, no, and slams the door. And they go to the next house and the little boy answers. And they said, do you happen to have a small piece of bread? We're very hungry. And the little boy goes, we have none and slams the door. And on and on throughout the whole village until they've been told no by everyone. And so the two travelers sit in the square and they talk to themselves and they said, let's make some soup. And they announce in a loud voice, we would like to make soup for everyone in the village, but all we need is a pot. And one of the villagers hears, is intrigued and comes out with a pot and says, here, you can use my pot. And so the travelers fill the pot with water and it starts to build a fire and it starts to bubble and steam's coming out. And the villagers are peeking out their windows, wondering what's happening. And the travelers take a stone from the road and they put it in the pot. And they say, we're making delicious stone soup. And it would be so good if only we had a carrot. Where are we gonna find a carrot? And one of the villagers piped up, well, I have a tiny carrot. You can have my carrot. And so she goes and brings a tiny carrot and puts it in the pot and it bubbles and bubbles. And then the travelers say, this is gonna be delicious. Oh, if only we had a potato. Quietly, one of the villagers says, well, I have a small piece of a potato. And they go to their home and they bring that piece of potato. And the next thing you know, somebody says, well, I have a kernel of corn. Somebody says, well, I have some celery. And on and on and on until this beautiful pot of stew is bubbling and bubbling. And the next thing you know, people are bringing out bread and fruit and the whole village enjoys this soup with the travelers. And there's much to be had and plenty for everyone. And as the travelers leave, they say to everyone, this soup has a special ingredient that you must remember, and it's called sharing. And they end the story with these words. If you want to make this soup, here is the recipe. Bring what you've got, put it in the pot. Every bit counts from the largest to the least. Together, we can create a stone soup feast. And the people said, Amen. Okay, church, you know what time it is. Hymn 552, standing on the promises. You know it, you love it. Sing with me. 
Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit sword standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Madison Avenue Baptist Church is located at 31st and Madison Avenue in New York City. Our website is www.mabcnyc.org.